exciting to be here and I hope to take advantage of it um, fully and uh, also exciting to be back here after so many years. I've given a few talks for ESSIG lunches over the last 10 years or so. Um, but I haven't given a talk here for almost 15 years, I think, and I think now that I'm working on vertebrates, I, I think it's uh, I finally earned my cred, <coughs> started to earn my cred. Um, and uh, today I'm going to kind of give you an overview of the theoretical work that I do for about a third of the talk. Um, and I want to do that, uh, I'm not going to show you lots of mathematical models or anything like that. I'm going to kind of give you a cartoon sketch of what I worked on. And I want to do that because I find that that's the best way to strike up conversations and potential collaborations with folks. And I'd love to have a lot of those conversations um, uh, while I'm here this semester. So um, please, uh, if you think something that I've said today is interesting and you want to talk more about it, please grab me or email me and we'll find a time to do that soon. And I'd love to hear more about your work as well. Um, so this isn't working, but that's OK. Um, so um, this is kind of one of these obnoxiously broad slides, but it really does encapsulate what I'm interested in, which is the evolution of cooperation in biology. <clears throat> balanced against uh, conflict or selfish interests. So, um, of course, we all know that at every level of biology, whether it's the level of the alleles uh, within a chromosome, cells within a developing organism, individuals within an animal society, or even species within a, individuals within a species community, natural selection favors self-interest and the uh, replication of certain biological units over other biological units often at the expense of alternative um, phenotypes, whether they be individuals or alternative alleles. And it's the cooperation coordination over and above this conflict, whether it be at the genome level, um, coordination of gene expression, overcoming genetic conflict and selfish genetic elements, or selfish cellular lineages, such as in cancer, that causes systems to remain stable over evolutionary time. So I sort of take this levels of selection approach in my work, um, but I do focus on animal societies and cooperation and conflict within those societies. But I'm interested in these other levels and how they interact. I'm writing a review paper right now on how um, uh, kin selection, for example, within animal societies can stabilize mutualisms between species. So um, very, very interested in kind of all these different levels of uh, biology. Now it's working. Cool. So like I said, I work on animal societies, and of course animal societies uh, vary pretty broadly in their, um, in their signature and also in the types of taxa. These are some of the sort of model systems that have been studied uh, in terms of uh, animals and how they interact in their discrete societies. <coughs> Today I'm going to talk about um, the work I've done with these societies and trying to understand the maintenance of cooperation in the face of conflict and selfish interests um, using a couple different types of currency. I'm going to talk about the mathematical models I've been developing over the last 14 years, uh, but only just a, a few snippets. Uh, don't worry, it's not going to be too overwhelming. Um, then I'm going to talk about the work I've been doing at San Francisco State, and I'm only going to highlight um, a couple of studies we did with these colonial earwigs that we've been working on um, that are technically um, not communal nesters, but they exhibit a lot of the same forms of conflict. Um, that I've been studying in the past. And then I'm going to talk about the work I'm doing now with uh, Vance Vredenberg and um, others on the relationship between salamander sociality and disease transmission. So, um, like I said, uh, I work on animal societies. In particular, I work on communal breeders. So I define communal breeders, um, say as opposed to cooperative breeders, um, as basically a situation where you have at least uh, two females that come together to share reproduction and offspring care. Okay? And this could be cooperative. It could also be a, a form of, say, parasitism if you have a brood parasite that doesn't really contribute to offspring care but does contribute to uh, offspring numbers. Say in this case here, for example, this female produces three offspring, blue offspring here, this female produces some yellow offspring. I'm showing you a lot of these kind of cartoons. So I um, <clears throat> hope they don't get too annoying, but they serve my point to say that we have basically some form of shared uh, brood. And whether it's these bearing nicrophorous beetles that are a classic system in entomology for studying uh, communal nesting, or these white-fronted bee eaters that are a classic system in ornithology, 
we're interested in, uh, I'm interested in this particular situation. And historically, I've mostly focused in my modeling work on how individual females in these cooperative associations, once they've crossed the threshold into sociality being evolutionarily stable, how they negotiate the costs of sociality. Okay? Given uh, species that are iteroparous, and any investment in current offspring in terms of offspring care is likely to decrease their future residual reproductive value and future um, offspring production, um, what might maintain an asymmetry, say, where this female contributes very little to offspring care and this female contributes quite a bit, okay? And so that's the work I've mostly done in the past, but today I'm going to talk about a different type of, of asymmetry. Um, that work in the past, though, um, mostly those models I tested and may have talked about years before, and certainly at the Essig lunches, on this tree hopper system that I worked on, where we have an asymmetry and egg guarding care, or we have a, a host female or a primary female that lays eggs on a goldenrod plant, and a second female that comes and lays eggs in with that clutch, but leaves without providing the same sort of investment in um, the uh, the care of the clutch. And what I found in my work uh, previously is that by leaving uh, prematurely she enjoys a higher overall lifetime reproductive success and also that this tactic is both density and frequency dependent in terms of the proportion of females in these societies on a goldenrod plant and mark and follow individuals that exhibit these alternative tactics and also the density of host nests really affects the uh, costs and benefits of this uh, asymmetry. Sorry, I keep getting the direction mixed up. Today I want to talk to you about sort of what happens first, uh, which is um, the production of offspring. Before offspring get cared for and before there's conflict over um, who has to bear the burden of offspring care, there's the question of who gets to produce the offspring in the first place. And um, of course offspring uh, production is the currency of natural selection. Um, their success is equally important. Uh, as we heard recently, but um, this asymmetry in offspring production uh, is something that's pervasive throughout animal societies, and it ranges in vertebrates and invertebrates from complete uh, dominance, say, by one female in the group uh, to more equitable reproduction. And we view this, uh, those of us that work on this question, as a form of conflict uh, because the question arises as to why this female would tolerate a smaller fraction seemingly unfair, inequitable fraction of reproduction, you would think that this would be selected out by natural selection. And we call this reproductive skew. Okay, so in this case, reproduction is skewed towards this particular female. Okay, so I'm going to talk to you just in general about some work I'm doing in this field of modeling called reproductive skew theory, which tries to understand how these asymmetries can be maintained over evolutionary time. In general, models of reproductive skew um, tend to fall into a few different categories. The two main categories they fall into are what's called transactional models and tug-of-war models. And quite simply um, put, the tug-of-war models are um, predicting the uh, allocation of offspring based on threats of costly competition between two females that are sharing a nest. The idea being that a female may concede reproduction um, in order to avoid the other female sort of uh, taking down the group productivity by fighting and disrupting their potentially coordinated reproductive effort. Transactional models are more like a bar, they're basically bargaining theory, where um, each female uh, is thought to basically um, uh, allow the other female to produce some fraction of the offspring based on uh, what she might be able to otherwise obtain from leaving the group and breeding solitarily. Okay, so you might imagine in these models, transactional models where individual females are trading off solitary reproduction for shared reproduction, it really matters what opportunities they have outside the social group in terms of uh, how strongly they can bargain for shared reproduction within the group. And these are split into concessions and restraint models, and I won't go into those. Um, they basically kind of fall into a group at Cornell who produced a lot of these models and a group at Cambridge that produced a lot of these models. But um, 
uh, they do differ in the assumptions that they make. And, and I want to highlight a paper that I worked, published a few years ago with Pete Buston at Boston University, where we sort of tried to take a larger, kind of higher altitude view of this uh, phenomenon because there were so many models out there and there was a lot of confusion among empiricists and actually theoreticians as well about which models applied under which conditions. And what we decided from the on outset is that these models that try and understand the resolution of these conflicts over reproduction really often start with limiting assumptions about which female controls reproduction or which female controls group membership. And they really limit the generality of these models. And so almost all of the arguments that were going on about which models were more applicable had to do with the limiting assumptions, which uh, people never tested anyway and um, were very often very difficult to test. And so what we did was we sort of took a step back and kind of started from first principles and allowed both of these um, females, basically, allowed females to negotiate based on either of these um, criteria, costly competition or <coughs> outside uh, options for breeding. And without going into the mathematics of the model, the outcome, so it was published a few years ago now, um, was that we basically got this really interesting phenomenon where we had like an emergent dominant, basically. So we didn't really go in assuming each any female was a dominant. But based on their relative competitive ability, and that's competition for reproduction within a group, but also competition in terms of um, kicking out another individual if they felt like it would be better to be solitary and inherit the territory, for example. Um, based on their competitive abilities, we found some really interesting um, dynamics. One is that there's basically a large region of group stability, okay, and such that, you know, there's not necessarily like one value for a reproductive skew, say. And a lot of the criticisms of reproductive skew theory are that it, it, it predicts a knife's edge kind of allocation of reproduction, and if there's any stochasticity, then it becomes evolutionarily unstable. Well, what we, what we sort of try to stress is that there's just an entire region here where you can split up reproduction. In this case, once the group's reproduction that's graphed here gets large enough and you can graph it on any parameter value, then basically the, it becomes so beneficial to be in a group that you start from a knife edge splitting up where it's barely stable to a very uh, plastic kind of division of reproduction, which could explain a lot of the variation um, that's been observed when trying to test these models. And we talk about how individuals can likely negotiate within this window based on cognitive mechanisms and signaling and that sort of thing. But the point here I want to make is that where uh, the society might fall on this division of reproduction and resolving the conflict really depends on either the um, outside options, which we s define as P here, which is basically the minimum required share that, in this case, individual A needs based on what she could get if she left the group voluntarily. And then also it can be defined um, relative to the uh, minimum amount of reproduction that individual B demands based on what she could uh, impose on the group by fighting with the other female in terms of reducing their group output. And what we found was that um, the more competitive individual often, not surprisingly, <laughs> can uh, negotiate based on this alternative criteria, which really changes the predictions and allows the models to sort of become synthesized, really. Allows females to negotiate based on either of those types of um, criteria that I outlined at the beginning that were previously disparate in the theoretical literature. So I've been using this, um, sorry, <laughs> been using this uh, model of, um, of uh, general model of reproductive skew in the last year or two to extend to some unanswered questions in um, social evolution. And one uh, way in which I've extended this model is in collaboration with Bruce Lyon at UC Santa Cruz, which is to try and look at species that exhibit both joint nesting, which I'm changing the terminology here for birds, and also brood parasitism. And there are some species that, uh, birds that exhibit both. And we're basically considering uh, brood parasitism as an alternative reproductive tactic where females could go and lay eggs in the nests of conspecifics and then alternatively, so that would be their outside option, just like going to nest solitarily. Their inside option would be nesting, say, with a dominant female or a resident female who's starting to construct a nest, and then enjoying some fraction of shared reproduction or reproductive skew. And so we've been predict trying to predict um, 
the conditions under which females might choose these alternative tactics and how the options for brood parasitism in terms of nest density, et cetera, and the cost of parasitism might feed back into the evolution of cooperation and cooperative breeding, um, also in terms of um, skew within those cooperative societies. So here's just an example of one of the <laughs> outcomes of this model, which is that as the cost of parasitism, not surprisingly, uh, increase in terms of the um, imposition of reduced hatching success on the host, um, cooperation here, which is the gray area, becomes more likely at a certain group size, which would be the, the combined clutch of a female that nests with a host. Um, and interestingly, host relatedness, there's been a lot of debate that I've been involved with in my work with kinship and brood parasitism. As host parasite relatedness um, goes up, females are much more likely to not go and parasitize kin, um, but rather um, stay and cooperate with this third female, mm -hmm. nesting female, and form a cooperative society. And then that's, the, the model gets much more complex than this, and we have a lot of three-dimensional graphs and output, but this is just one example um, in way I've extended it. Another is to um, look at the division of labor within animal societies. And so Pete and I have been working on a model where we basically um, ask the question, Given that females can uh, reproduce solitarily, here say uh, this female can produce this many offspring in a solitary nest, this female can produce this many, um, if, what are the conditions under which, first of all, a um, social group would form? And if so, and that's been modeled quite a bit, um, what are the conditions under which we might expect complete skew versus some form of shared reproduction? And so you might, um, uh, view this as a complete form of um, uh, uh, skew and potentially complete conflict where this female doesn't produce any offspring. And that's a form of division of labor or say non-reproductive casts, say in social insects. And so we're thinking of it in the context of uh, say sterile workers and hymenopteran societies or helping behavior. And of course lots of birds, the helpers are males. But there are some species like Seychelles warblers where the helpers are females. And um, asking the question, uh, when might those females actually um, have conflict over reproduction versus give up reproduction entirely and be a helper um, in a nest with, with a dominant female? Um, so the last uh, extension of this model is the one I've been working on most recently, and I'll be working on while I'm here in terms of trying to get this out and published. And um, this is asking a question of whether there can be parent-offspring conflict over reproductive skew. So um, in most of these animal societies, the offspring don't really have much power, right? I mean, obviously, if it's eggs or something like that, the eggs aren't really doing anything. Um, even uh, nymphs or um, juveniles are often not able to exert any influence on reproductive allocation and the resolution of conflict within these societies. But one exception, uh, where, say, a daughter here might actually be able to suppress reproduction by the co-breeding female could be in the case of, say, ant colonies or other eusocial hymenoptera where the offspring remain for a long period of time and influence reproduction. And we now know um, that uh, in some ant colonies, workers have quite a large influence on uh, queen reproduction. There's this classic case um, by Laurent Keller uh, and colleagues showing that, um, and this of course has been heralded as a green beard allele, the GP9 locus, but um, in this particular case with um, Solenopsis, uh, female potential co-breeders are actually excluded and killed by the worker daughters of the focal queen. And these are potential cooperator, cooperators, so this is actually a case of um, an individual worker excluding the entire reproduction of a potential co-breeder. A more subtle form, which is maybe more uh, appropriate for this particular example, would be by leptothorax, um, some recent work showing that they can harass a queen and actually reduce the number of eggs that she lays pretty dramatically, and that this uh, is a variable behavior within, among colonies. So that sometimes workers <coughs> uh, attempt to suppress the reproduction of the co-breeding queen, and sometimes they don't. And so this model is partic possibly particularly useful for these, these kinds of cases. And taking this kind of third dimension, where instead of traditionally looking at 
the allocation of reproduction within a sort of horizontal society where you have multiple breeding females, now asking how this parent-offspring conflict might influence that resolution or enhance that conflict. So why might there be conflict between offspring and their moms over uh, who gets to reproduce? <clears throat> well, um, first of all, I should note that monogamy is the ancestral mating condition in all the hymenoptera. But if we're going to just focus here on ants, um, you can see here in blue that monogamy, which means that females mate with just one male, as pictured here, um, is the ancestral condition and then all these different genera so you have these derived conditions of um, polyandry where females will mate with more than one male. The reason this was an uh, important uh, result was because there's been a lot of argument in the last few years and in fact there's been argument for decades about the importance of <clears throat> mating systems in the hymenoptera in terms of maintaining <clears throat> eusociality and uh, sterile casts. Uh, most of those arguments being based on kin selection theory and um, a lot of recent uh, arguments in favor of ecological constraints and higher levels of selection have um, sort of uh, come into play as well. So there's been a lot of debate about this. Um, many of you are maybe familiar with those arguments. But what I want to show here is that monogamy or mating with one male is the ancestral condition. So what my model shows is that under monogamy, and I'm just going to show you these cartoons, um, instead of the mathematical um, formulations and derivations of the Buston and Zink model. But under monogamy, we basically have a situation where the current workers here, say these are female daughters, okay, of each of these queens, and so there are many different species, say, of ants where you have what are called um, polygynous uh, ant societies where you have multiple queens that are breeding. Um, under these conditions, you'll have workers uh, that come, female workers that come from fertilized eggs from each of those two queens, right? Okay, and those are the workers that are helping to maintain the colony and also raising these future offspring, okay? Now, um, under haplodiploidy, where males are an unfertilized egg, right, that the queen lays, so they're haploid, okay? You all are probably familiar with this um, unusual situation of a 0.75 genetic relatedness between two full siblings. Okay, that's because they get 100%, they're 100% <coughs> Uh, similar on the paternal side because the, the father only has one pair of chromosomes basic, basically to uh, pass on. And um, so the coefficient of relatedness here is the probability that two individuals share the same copy of an allele. Okay, that's identical by descent. Um, now these two females uh, are related genetically by the um, uh, parameter R here, which is uh, genetic relatedness. And what you see here is that this particular uh, worker is genetically related to this uh, worker of the other queen by R times 0.25, okay? And that's because she, uh, there's the dilution of the genetic relatedness between these two queens, but then there's also, um, of course, the fact that they have different fathers, presumably which means they get rid of that entire half of their genome that could be potentially similar, okay? And what this means is that the ratio or the relative genetic relatedness of a female to her full sibling versus a worker of the other queen is now a 3 to 1 ratio times R rather than a 1 to 1 ratio times R, okay? So there's a 3 to 1 discord in terms of um, their genetic similarity. That's all I'm going to really say about that, except when you plug that into our model, um, you get some really interesting dynamics, which is that um, as the relatedness, genetic relatedness between two queens increases, the uh, parent-offspring conflict goes way up. Um, in fact, the uh, difference in the reproductive skew value or optimum from the perspective of a worker in terms of what proportion of the offspring she would quote-unquote want her mother to produce uh, in terms of future queens relative to the other reproducing queen is much higher even than her mom uh, is willing to concede. And that goes way up here for um, uh, reproductive shares based on cost of competition and it also goes up pretty dramatically for 
uh, reproductive shares based on that other criteria of outside breeding. <coughs> and so the point is, is that there's a fair degree of um, conflict between these workers and uh, their, their moms, actually, in terms of how uh, future reproductive brood should be allocated. So I'm using this model uh, to sort of make some predictions about how that would play out in ant societies. Um, polyandry makes that asymmetry completely go away. When females mate with multiple males, no longer is this female uh, assured to have the same father as her sister, and therefore the conflict sort of disappears. And so uh, the same sort of thing happens um, with uh, drones or the production of male offspring. Um, <clears throat> and so in that case, because the males are only haploid, this female queen only um, basically produces, uh, lay, basically lays an unfertilized egg, of which that, ha that genome is similar to only half of her genome, but on probability on half the time and half that genome, they share the same allele. And so now their relatedness is 0.25, which cancels out and there's no conflict. So what I'm doing now is going through the phylogeny, uh, original phylogeny, trying to map on um, which of these uh, ant genera and species uh, are uh, joint nesting queens or polygynous ants and whether there's a correlation uh, between the evolution of um, polyandry and sex ratio in terms of drone production in terms of resolving conflict with, within these ant societies and the mating system. So that's one of the things I'm going to be working on on the side while I'm here. Um, so uh, let's talk about some actual um, animals now. Um, and uh, this is an earwig that we've been working on since we started at San Francisco State. One of the things about coming out to California from New York um, is that I, I couldn't find as many insects as I was used to finding, and um, particularly social insects. And I've, I've found this really cool uh, insect that's invaded um, Northern California. Uh, cool despite the fact it's invasive, but it nests along the, uh, it's a marine earwig, and it nests along the shores in the San Francisco Bay. And like all earwigs, um, it has uh, maternal care, so these, these moms lay eggs and take care of their uh, offspring by cleaning the eggs, protecting the eggs. And um, what we were interested in is whether these might be, because they were highly colonial, whether there might be any cooperation in nesting or whether there might be any conflict among these females that nest right close to one another on, on the shore. Say here where we worked at the Audubon Center in Tiburon. This was work uh, that I'm going to talk about today by my graduate student Julie Miller and an undergraduate Lena Rudolph. Um, and, um, sorry. <laughs> so uh, we did this field experiment where we tried to figure out the uh, whether there was a benefit of maternal care. We, we put out these nest boxes where we had females nest in the wild. We also did the same experiment in the lab. And just to show you, uh, there is a, a large advantage of uh, female maternal care. In the field, females that were, remained with their offspring had a much higher um, hatching success rate relative to the female nest where we removed the females. And this was mostly due to Argentine ants, but as I'll show you, that's not the whole story, uh, which is interesting, one invasive species eating another. Um, mm -hmm. Argentine ants would eat the eggs and carry them away. Um, in the lab, we found it was mostly fungus, so these females um, clean microbes off their eggs, and, uh, and without a female, uh, the hatching success was quite low in the lab. So um, here is a uh, video of a phenomenon that we also observed a lot in nature. Um, the nests, here's another nest here, so you can see the nests are quite close together. And here's a female that has invaded the nest of another female. Now this would be under a log, so I've lifted the log up. But what's happening here is this female has basically pushed this female out of the way and is, is starting to now eat her eggs. And so this is something that's fairly common uh, out in the field. And it's something we decided we wanted to look at in the lab as well, and whether maternal care might actually have a, a role to play in the evolution or in the importance of, of, of egg guarding. So here's just another picture of how close their nests can be. Here are some individual nests. And so you can see there's a lot of uh, opportunities to invade another female's nest. So we did a, a, a quick experiment in the lab where we had a, uh, we removed a mom and had a control where the mom was allowed to remain with her eggs, and then we put in a conspecific. And what we found was that when the mom was around, 
um, basically a smaller fraction of eggs were eaten and we would count the number of eggs on a daily basis uh, relative to when the mom was removed and so this conspecific female was able to eat the mom's <coughs> eggs when she wasn't around um, that that translated into a uh, lower hatching success as well the reason this is so high is because there's some filial cannibalism involved and so we've been really interested in the conditions and published a paper as well on the conditions under which a female might actually eat her own eggs and <coughs> the reason they do this is because the risk of um, leaving your nest appears to be quite high because other females will come in and eat your eggs. So females don't tend to leave their nests to forage during the three week period while they're incubating and cleaning the eggs. So this creates this kind of interesting dilemma where females are basically dependent on the energetic investment in, in guarding their own offspring. They're sometimes forced to actually eat their own offspring to sustain that level of protection. Um, so in future work we want to um, investigate that sort of behavioral dilemma um, and noting that this risk of foraging either for other eggs or for their main prey which is um, these uh, amphipods um, is both frequency and density dependent. It depends on the number of other females that are nesting as well because they're not likely to be out roaming and foraging as often and so it really depends on the synchrony of nesting. We found that nesting tends to be highly synchronized in nature at first we thought it might be due to the lunar cycle because the high, high tides uh, tend to inundate these nests. Um, they are just at the high, high tide mark and it tends to inundate, inundate the nests and we thought well maybe you know, they're, they're timing their nesting so as to avoid um, being uh, covered in, in seawater. Um, but it, I think it's more likely now to be something more uh, with respect to conspecific signaling something more like mass seeding, say in plants, or something where they're picking up on similar cues, and um, potentially breeding in synchrony to actually avoid infanticide and, and conspecific egg cannibalism. And there's been a few studies, there's one in evolution recently with mice showing that um, synchronizing their uh, reproduction uh, can actually really reduce the probability of infanticide for obvious reasons, right? Females are much less likely to to um, invest and abandon their own offspring on an infanticidal belt uh, when they're themselves uh, in maternal mode. Um, so we're going to do some experiments where we're going to manipulate the timing of the nests and also alternative prey that's available. Um, so let me talk about the work uh, that I've just started that sort of led me to do my sabbatical here in Salamanders. What, how am I on time? What, what time is it? Is it like ten minutes. I've got ten minutes? Perfect. Okay, cool. So. Um, this is work I'm doing in collaboration with Vance Breedenberg, one of your uh, alumni, um, and uh, you may be an affiliate or something. <laughs> but um, we started this work, we've been, we started together at San Francisco State, became close friends very quickly, and we're trying to find something to do together um, and get money to do together. And so I was interested in communal nesting, and he of course works on chytridium mycosis, this uh, disease which we uh, um, BD for short, uh, chytrid fungus, of course, uh, everyone's familiar with, that's uh, unfortunately um, infecting amphibians around the world. Um, and so we decided the genus Petrangiceps might be an ideal system to work together on because they are highly social. Here's a, uh, a photo from a copia paper by Elizabeth Jakush, another uh, alum of the MVZ, uh, for Petrangiceps gregarius, where they lay up to 200 eggs together. Um, and here are a few adults. Um, even Petrachiceps attenuatus, which is found locally here, um, is highly social, both grouped together. And our question was, well, here you have an aquatic fungus. And Carla did some work showing, preliminary work showing that Petrachiceps has the fungus. And we know from another student, Weinstein, through here, that, um, that they're susceptible and that they do have the fungus. Um, how could an aquatic <coughs> fungus spread in a terrestrial organism? Uh, and the thought was that, well, maybe it's their sociality that's, that's uh, impl implicated in this spread. Um, so what Carla did was she went through the museum specimens, many of them here, and thank you, Carol, for all your patience with all the swabber, the team of swabbers. <laughs> um, and uh, Carla swabbed a bunch of petrachiceps, attenuatus, and randomly, because there's basically 20,000 specimens, um, she randomly chose them from the 40s up through the present day, um, from each county, each of uh, um, uh, 12 counties in seven different decades, 
and randomly chose them per decade. And so what we were trying to do was reconstruct the history of spread of the disease in this group. And we use this technique that advances help pioneer using the ITS region of 18S ribosomal RNA um, to actually quantify the number of zoospores that might be present on the skin of these salamanders. And um, the DNA is actually, uh, uh, in this case, the uh, RNA is quite viable, um, even though it's been um, uh, preserved in formalin and alcohol. Um, and that's because it's subdermal. And so you can swathe them and abrade the skin and actually amplify. And what we found um, in this study was that, and this is pretty typical of the other work that's been done in the Vredenberg lab, but there's been this outbreak in Northern California starting in the late 60s and sort of peaking in the 90s. And this is both for the um, proportion of individuals that are infected, and you'll notice it's not that high in sepsis; it's only about 15%. Um, and also the, uh, the number of um, spores per individual here in the blue line. And what's interesting is that here in the field work that she did in 2013, despite the drought, was able to get almost 400 individuals <coughs> across 13 populations, that there doesn't appear to be you know, any higher of a um, BD level uh, than there was back in the 90s. If anything, it seems to be dropping off. What's interesting, though, is Carla found that those populations that were positive, the more recently that they were um, uh, positive, the more um, uh, likely they were to aggregate. Um, and similarly uh, here, this is the year of the historical positive, this is the proportion of individuals infected, more individuals were likely to be infected in those populations, which doesn't surprise me too much. So the question we had um, here was whether there's a correla this correlation is an adaptive response to infection or whether it's more likely to simply spread in populations where individuals are more social. So we're doing these uh, lab experiments where we're inoculating individuals with BD and we're putting them into groups of different sizes. And this is done by Kendra Ritchie, a shared graduate student. Um, and we're, we're creating these groups. The first round of this experiment created groups of one or three individuals with one individual uh, inoculated or no individuals inoculated. And we're tracking BD every six days, tracking the position of individuals every two days so that we can correlate both um, how behavior in terms of, this is a very common uh, scene here for attenuatus, how their behavior in terms of their degree of piling on each other um, and sociality is correlated with the, the spread from the inoculated individual to another individual, um, and also how BD might change their behavior. There's a recent science paper showing that BD uh, can change the behavior of hosts. And so um, this is just a, this is sort of just a couple days ago. Um, the experiment just ended a few days ago, but this is just a, so I'm just going to show you an example of a few of the cages. Here's the individual that was inoculated. You can see this is every six days, the BD <coughs> level. Um, and uh, eventually that individual died. Um, but before it died, it infected these two individuals here. One of the, those two died. They're dying at a very low zoospore count, which is much lower than sort of the 10,000 sort of called the Breedenberg rule, <laughs> um, but which is interesting. So Petrachocept are high, they seem to be highly susceptible to BD um, if they contract it. Um, they'll die at very low uh, levels of BD, which may explain why their proportion of individuals in the wild is so low. Here's another one where the infected individual transferred into a second individual. That individual died, but the, the first individual didn't. Um, interestingly enough, we had a few groups just that we actually created with a naturally infected individual. And you can see how virulent um, this was. This was the individual that was naturally infected with two uninfected individuals. It spread to those two uninfected individuals immediately. And all three of them died very quickly. So clearly the strain we're using for in our first round for the inoculations is a, a weaker strain, maybe a less specific strain than the strain that's present in the populations. It was taken from the mountain yellow-legged frog, of course. So. Um, that's something we have to reckon with. Um, I have a couple minutes left, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, we're, we're doing the exact same experiments uh, in museum work with uh, two other species of Petrachoceps. <coughs> These are the two graduate students working on those two species. We're finding some really interesting stuff. So we're finding um, some nests of Petrachoceps gregarious. I mean, it's been probably the worst possible time to work on salamanders <laughs> with the drought. But we're still finding some nests of gregarious, just like Liz did. Um, and we're finding these, this is one of the nests we found. 
Um, we're finding a similar <coughs> dynamic in terms of the historical population dynamics of infection. We're also working with Lucier, which is down by Monterey, and we're finding some really interesting things. Like this summer, they had these groups of like 30 or 40 individuals, um, which is really, really interesting, um, which no one's really seen before. So the tracheoseps might even be more social than we ever thought, um, which might have real implications. In fact, this group would have had a really high infection level. Um, so that might really be an important new dimension in terms of understanding this dynamic. Um, the other thing, of course, we, can't, we, we, we couldn't resist working on Incitina. Uh, everyone knows uh, Incitina Schulchii, and um, I think you can't be admitted into the NBZ without knowing about it. Um, but um, what's fascinating is uh, two of our students just finished swabbing over 2,000 of these, doing the same randomized historical uh, approach, and they don't seem to have much BD. It's uh, less than 2% of all the specimens as opposed to up to 15% of all the specimens and batracoseps. So this is uh, something we want to follow up on. We're thinking there might be some uh, mutualistic bacteria that are spread uh, through their parental care. Here's a nest we found with Platensis, um, and, or through their mating. And um, I'll skip over this, but basically suffice it to say that bacteria have been found in other salamanders that um, can be spread in groups that are beneficial for offspring survival and anti have antimicrobial properties. Um, and so we have uh, two graduate students who are collaborating with Jose de la Torre um, to basically try and understand um, uh, in the classic ring um, the degree to which these microbial communities, and we're using next generation sequencing, we, we just got an Illumina sequencer at San Francisco State, which is pretty cool. And um, so we're um, now trying to do these microbial profiles of the different subspecies. We're comparing it to the, the consp uh, sorry, the uh, heterospecific Petrachoseps and the soil to try and understand if um, the process of speciation and then also these hybrid zones, going back to sort of some of Sean's populations as well, in Xanthoptica and Oregonensis, and trying to understand whether there might be a microbial signal in terms of the evolutionary history, and then also whether that might actually correlate, hopefully negatively, with uh, BD prevalence. Um, we're also doing susceptibility trials in the lab and all sorts of stuff like that. So um, if I can finally get the direction right, I want to thank mm -hmm. so many people, um, and also thank the NDZ in particular for allowing us to swab so many of specimens. We're still, we're still coming, and we're going to be solving a bunch more. But thank you very much for your attention.